aid also an exchange between different stakeholder groups as we have them here in the room, uh, different countries, etc., to really discuss the questions, what is the right level of regulation to not harm innovation but also to ensure privacy and, and security of the individual, how to make sure um, that countries can choose their regulatory models and get inspired by what is out there but also stick to some certain values. So I mean there, there are all of these questions out there that we would like to tackle in this panel and that's why I'm very, very happy to introduce my three speakers today that I have. So on my right is Helani Galapaya, the CEO of Asia, a pro-poor and pro-market think tank working on uh, digital policy and regulatory issues in the Asia-Pacific region. Welcome, Helani. Um, in the middle, I have my colleague Pascal Koenig, who is also working for GIZ, the German Development Agency. And he is an in-house consultant working with projects across the world on digital policy and data governance. Welcome, Pascal. And then on the right, I have John Stewart, who co-initiated and coordinated uh, the world's first global citizen assembly, uh, the 2021 Global Assembly on Climate and Ecological Crisis. And he's also co-founder and managing director of the Innovation for Policy Foundation, short I for Policy, that is reimagining public participation. Well, thank you for being here with us. And um, without further ado, let me, um, before we start the panel, uh, get also some insights from you that have been already on Mentimeter. So Nina, if you could put up the Mentimeter poll again on the screen, um, because we have a second question. I already alluded to the fact that uh, digital transformation brings a lot of challenges for regulation with it. So before we start, maybe we can give our panelists also some inspirations. Um, what, from your perspective, are the challenges when it comes to regulatory models for the digital transformation? So I've alluded to some already in the introduction. We're going to cover, of course, many more. But let's see what comes to your mind. Well, technical complexity, maybe also using Mentimeter, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Fragmentation, perfect, we're going to cover that. Well, I guess I'll let the Mentimeter poll running on the screen so we can also always look at it during the session. So please feel free. I think you can put up to three answers in there. Um, so we will let it run and look at it during the session a little bit. But um, let me start the, the discussion and looking at our panelists. And, and maybe we have to take a step back and, 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 and look again. When we talk about regulation and about digital transformation, what are actually the challenges? What, what is regulation about and, and what makes it special? And maybe I can ask this question to you, Helani. Um, what are particularly acute challenges around the globe on that? Sure, and I'll, I mean, I'm, I'll be very framed from a developing Global South point of view, but these are relevant to other countries. Uh, I think for me the starting point is that every country or very different starting points for countries and that has real implications on how we think about digitalization. Uh, different levels of connectivity, different levels of skill among regulatory staff, policy staff as well as people. Um, so you know a lot of developing countries are at this point of how do we get the biggest benefits out of ICTs. I want a national AI policy and I want a national this policy without having the requisite policies and regulations around AI or data and so on, right? And these are in conflict and these are in different regulatory silos. So it really matters because countries are trying to get ahead economically, but also trying to manage the other complexities of technology. Um, and it also has implications on sort of being able to completely make decisions based on data because half the people are not online, for example. You can't achieve the cost savings of digitalization of government services because you still need to maintain face-to-face -face services. So it's a very different context in developing countries. Then, of course, the challenge every country faces is that digital services at all layers of the network are provided by private sector providers. So that really questions the kind of regulatory approaches. Uh, the in-country network provision, you still can command and control if you want to from a regulator's point of view because the interests 
private companies have put in huge network investments the and want to make money. The government, you know, wants to make huge tax revenues, which they are, so you can command and control them. But uh, all the application layer stuff, anything above that is in some other country. So no longer does this national regulatory model work, really. It might work in large countries with a huge market size that can demand that the application layer people register and have offices in the country. But if you're a country like Sri Lanka or Niue with, you know, thousand something people, market exit is a real option for pr private sector providers, which means you're leaving your citizens with less choice. So the international negotiations are important and few developing countries participate in international standard setting and development. So that's a real challenge, again, from that point of view. Um, the, you know, particularly when it comes to content platforms, that's really important. When it comes to taxation, this is really important. Then the regulatory models, um, compliance models, based on the sort of ex-ante regulators and ex-post competition, these all fall apart when we come to multi-sided markets like platforms. It's very hard to find the comp you know, sort of uh, competition rules. It's also very hard to regulate when, for example, algorithmic decision making, when the immediate effect of a decision is not seen, perhaps for years once the feedback loop kicks in and lots of people have been marginalized and regulatory systems aren't set up for that kind of feedback loops and course correction. So a whole lot of challenges, particularly from developing country points of view. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alani. I think uh, you alluded already to a lot of um, very important positions here where especially developing countries find themselves in, in a world that is dominated by big private tech companies. Uh, maybe, John, maybe I can get you in here also on this point. How do you view that? How, how do you view maybe are there different categories of regulatory models that, that especially developing countries have to find maybe their position in? How do you view that? Yeah, thank you. And good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, you know, I think the fundamental question is what type of societies do we want to live in and where do we want this digital transformation ultimately to take us? You know, more um, unchecked state control or more unchecked individual liberty? And, you know, as Halani pointed out, a lot of small countries are really the recipients of regulatory frameworks that are developed outside of their borders. And at the moment, many countries essentially have a choice between three different models. They have a model of sort of state spying, surveillance, unchecked state control. They have a model of corporate spying or unchecked individual liberty. And then they have a, an option of a rights-based model, but a rights-based model that was developed outside of their borders and often without their participation. And so I think that's really the fundamental question that we want to ask ourselves is, you know, is, is the internet sort of a, a tool and a you know, an enabler of individual agency and, you know, transformation or, or we, you know, what type of societies is this really pushing us towards? So, you know, we'd really be pushing for much more participatory and inclusive um, development of these models and engaging um, in a much more multi-stakeholder approach. Thank you very much, John. And um, maybe um, Helani Yoffa also pointed out to it already in the beginning when you said like it's much easier to regulate, for example, internet service providers that operate in your country and in, in your jurisdiction. Uh, but maybe let me bring another uh, angle in and, and turn to you, Pascal, here. Uh, if we look, we had a lot of sessions already at the IGF also on data and cross-border data flows. And here it gets even more complex and, and, and more um, difficult for countries to regulate, to assure the freedoms of, of citizens, individual rights but also the economic benefit. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on, on how you view that aspect when, when we talk about regulating also data markets and cross-border data flows. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. So yeah, very important points and challenges have already been highlighted. I'm just going to add one more that I think is very important within the context of this uh, panel, and that is governing data. Because data governance is really not just one single policy field, like pensions or labor, but rather it, it spans many different policy areas and kinds of policy, going well beyond privacy, consumer protection, for instance, against certain uses of AI, but also platform regulation, competition policy, open data policy, and so on. And because it is so multifaceted, it requires a comprehensive regulatory approach that can be more, but it cannot, cannot be less uh, consistent and coherent. And of course, the reason why one important reason why data is so, uh, has become so important and regulating data has become important is because it, of its economic importance. Some have argued that data is the new oil, uh, 
And yes, sure, data has become an important economic asset and a raw material that is now at the foundation of many forms of value creation. But data is also very different from oil, and it's important to, to keep that in mind. Because uh, first, data is different, as we can transfer and copy it, theoretically, at basically zero cost, uh, which means that it can f uh, flow very freely, it can circulate very freely. That's very different from oil, for instance. And that raises new and intricate questions about whether and when this is actually good that data is flowing so freely and when it, this is not so good. And a second um, way in which data is different that I want to highlight um, is that uh, at previous times of industrial change, certain resources, raw materials, uh, help to enhance or even automate physical processes. And now with data, we are increasingly able to also automate, automate or enhance cognitive processes. Um, so refining data can help to uh, inform decision making, but also can help with steering. And not just steering of physical processes, think about manufacturing, production, but also social processes. Um, for instance, on online platforms, content uh, curation, but also think about AI tools for, let's say, recruitment, where applicants are categorized, scored with regard to how suitable they are as candidates, just as one example. So data is very directly relevant for intervening into social relations and affecting, uh, steering, uh, steering society, ordering society, which means it is directly relevant for exerting social power. So that is very different about data. And um, uh, through intervening in society in that way, uh, data can, or the uses of data can uh, have also harms for privacy, for people's autonomy, because they might be steered in ways that they don't find acceptable, um, and it can lead to unfair discrimination based on biased decision making based on data. And from all this follows that, of course, governments can opt to uh, unlock uh, data as a resource to enable innovation, but this can come at a price um, because it can create harms to people's individual rights, their personal rights, but also can have systemic harms for society, for instance, for the, the public sphere. So governments have to navigate this important trade-off uh, and have to find the right balance between that, and that will depend on how much and how they're regulated. Thank you very much to the three of you. I think um, this was very interesting, and, and maybe just to, to briefly summarize it in, in a number of, um, well, dictamies that we have here that I heard out of this conversation between regulation on the national level versus on the international level, regulation focused on the individual or more focused on the collective, um, state-led digital transformation and, and regulation or more the economic sector, big private co tech companies that are setting the rules uh, in a field where there is no regulation yet. Um, so obviously countries are in front of huge challenges if, if you see that and Helani you've pointed to that to very um, in, in developing countries and countries where there may be not the capacities, where there's not a civil society that can help, um, it, it becomes particularly difficult. But what considerations, from your point of view, are guiding countries in, in deciding what, what kind of degree of regulation do we need and where do we set the boundaries? What are these considerations from your point of view? Sorry. Thank you. I think um, maybe it's sort of easy to talk through an example, just the conflict of policy objectives and what countries want. So, you know, balancing different policy objectives. Take, I think you were talking about data, so take the cross-border nature of data, and everyone talks about how good and how much we need that, right? Uh, for a government point of view, uh, in industrial policy does and has in several countries, particularly in Asia, dictated that you want local hosting. Why? Because that's a way to grow the sector. It creates a lot of professionals who are competent in it. It brings in foreign revenue. It opens up data centers and so on. So it's a matter of industrial policy, interestingly, right? Nobody's really done the economics of, you know, whether that actually uh, pays off, but that's certainly a matter of industrial policy. And countries proudly say that, you know, because we banned X, now we have this much investment, right? It's not really a cost-benefit analysis. So that's one side of it. 
then is the need, the legitimate need to access data for crime prevention, financial fraud, etc. And for a long time, I think there was no recognition that this is a legitimate need to access data. And often that data, particularly platform data from global providers, lies elsewhere. So we have to have a mechanism because that's one of the other reasons people oppose that, right? So law enforcement, you know, fraud prevention, etc. That's another policy objective, which is now in conflict with this idea, right? Then uh, there is this idea that for innovation and for cost savings, you know, certainly for organizations like mine, which do a lot of large-scale data analytics, using the cloud is much cheaper than running our service in the country or buying really poor services in a, you know, in a Sri Lankan market. So for that, you actually want free flow of data for you know, getting data during COVID from multiple people you want. So for development and innovation, cross-border data you want. And then there are, of course, the you know, authoritarian regimes, which just want complete control over people, the ability to, to spy over them, so you want the data in-house. So there's sort of at least four forces there, right, which are in conflict and even within governments in conflict with each other. The second point, so you know, you need to kind of decide that, right? That's what the kind of thing they need to think through. The second really is you want to be able to take global conversations and global policies which are de being developed, particularly to govern the new digital economy, like GDPR, various privacy laws, and to have the ability to adapt them to work in your country. So for example, GDPR is very, very fashionable. It's a wonderful ideal to aspire to. The cost of compliance for small, medium enterprises in developing countries is ridiculous. Cost of compliance for a large firm is also ridiculous, right? Um, but also, the cost of Enforcing that for a government is insane because they have no budgets to run these data commissioners or regulatory officers, right? So taking away something like the requirement for everyone to register, all data controllers and pro processors to register every year, which some data protection plans have, is a huge thing, eliminates a huge administrative burden because in the end you want to be able to send summons to, you want to address, right? You can do that through other means. So taking away that part of it instead of cutting and pasting from some other country and customizing it for how it works, I think is important. Research exceptions are important because countries in uh, the global south are trying to leapfrog. So customizing global things and having the skill to do that, I think, is really important in the new digital economy. Yeah, if I can come in on that. Um, I also want to highlight this outward-looking dimension of, of regulation, specifically as it concerns this aspect of digital sovereignty. Uh, because I think this is also one of the major issues when it comes to the regulation of the digital transformation these days. Um, as uh, the current situation in many parts of the world is one that has been called digital extractivism. Let's be careful with that term, but there are reasons certainly for it. As uh, in many countries, we find that the infrastructure is in the hands of non-domestic companies. The markets in the digital uh, economy are dominated by foreign businesses. And if you look at data that we've already talked about, um, it is very common that data is collected in the country, it is extracted, but then flows outside, where the actual refinement, the value creation takes place, so that the country in question then has to import technology and innovation. It's a technology taker again, while local industries cannot develop. So that is a very common situation. And um, this raises this uh, entire question of how to uh, enact proper regulation to achieve more digital sovereignty to make sure that, that countries can have more control over their own path of digital transformation, have their own infrastructure, have uh, their own local industries in the digital economy, and perhaps also be able, that they're able to shield their own citizens from certain technologies, from exposure to technologies that they deem unacceptable. Uh, so I think this is a, also a very important issue when it comes to regulation, besides these more inward-looking regulatory issues, it's also this more international, outward-looking dimension. Um, yeah, maybe to, to add a bit on this, against this backdrop, um, I think the, the European Union case is very interesting because uh, Europe or the EU um, is emphasizing digital sovereignty now as a core concept of its entire digital agenda. And second, I think one can say that the European Union has the most comprehensive digital agenda so far. It has enacted the most regulation, well not all of it has gone through the legislative process, but it's a huge agenda. And what is interesting about it, that it's very coherent in promoting digital sovereignty in the EU. And how does it do that? That's also maybe one lesson that could be interesting for other countries, although of course it's not easy to just translate from one context to another, but it could be a blueprint in some ways 
is that um, well, the European Union regulatory model has been framed as one that is about values, human rights-based model, as opposed to other models that are more state-led or more market-led. But this is actually only one uh, aspect of the EU regulatory model, because uh, another important, very strong and consistent dimension in the digital agenda for at least 10 years now, it's not very new, it has been there at least since the GDPR, uh, is um, this idea of building a digital single market and a digital single market that, and that's the important aspect, um, guarantees a level playing field. A level playing field, you find that in the EU discourse for at least a decade. That's a major goal uh, that the EU wants to achieve. And level playing field is not just this liberal idea of unleashing market forces within the digital single market. It's also about forcing other actors in the world to play by European Union rules. So that is there are two dimensions to this idea of a level playing field, and I think this could be an idea that's also perhaps uh, transferable to other contexts. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. That was very, very, very rich, and I think we're going to touch a little bit more upon all these terms and ideas you've brought to the table um, when I hear Brussels effect, um, export of, of digital regulation, how countries can adapt uh, to their own local needs, digital sovereignty, and all these aspects. I think in the last part of the panel, I would like to come back to that and look a little bit into this whole like global harmonization versus fragmentation field. But I would like to take one step back um, and, and, and look a little bit at the question when we talk about regulation again, and now we have established what it means in the digital sphere. Um, but if we just talk from the process of regulation and, and regulatory approaches, I would just like to know what is your take on in the digital transformation, and given all the phenomena you described, do we need new approaches? Do we need adapted approaches? What makes it different from a traditional regulatory process in, in other sectors? Like what do the regulators, what do civil society, academia, private sector need to take care of? What makes it different? Maybe I can pass it over to you, John, on this question. Sure. I think we can start by, by exploring the new forms of, of regulation that are needed. And I think it's important to recognize that that uh, regulation laws change incrementally and technology changes exponentially. This is what Downs called the law of disruption. Um, so we really need to think about the pace of, of regulatory reform, how often we regulate. We need to think about bringing in feedback loops into regulation. You know, in software, uh, we, we often talk about version control. So, you know, you have like version 1.1 of a software, um, you know, 1.2. Uh, we need to be thinking about our regulatory frameworks in a really similar way where we're really updating them very regularly. The second thing is thinking about how to make sure that the regulation itself is living, you know, and finding ways of not just having feedback loops, but integrating learning into the regulation itself through through forms of sandboxing and, and other forms of agile regulation. And I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague, Pascal, to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, gladly. Um, so uh, one way of balancing the trade-off um, that I mentioned earlier between innovation and, uh, on the other hand, protecting uh, consumers, protecting citizens, are perhaps agile forms of regulation, meaning more evidence-based, more flexible, uh, forms of regulation, and one important example of this regulation is, for instance, uh, regulatory sandboxes, which means uh, relax relaxing certain regulatory standards for a certain period and for certain uh, businesses that are in this so-called uh, sandbox uh, to test innovation. So testing innovation, innovation while at the same time still protecting consumers is one of the main goals of a regulatory sandbox, and a uh, second goal is also, also to learn from this kind of regulatory experiment to, to test out innovations and to see how the market works. Um, but again, I want to also um, point to some important trade-offs here. I don't want to be a buzzkill, but there are always certain uh, tra trade-offs involved because, uh, of course, you can have this kind of you know, <laughs> regulation that is more agile, experimental, to foster innovation, but uh, it is also much more demanding than the traditional rule-based regulation, which means uh, that you would need more resources, more personnel with know-how, more institutional capacities to actually uh, well, carry out these kind of regulatory experiments. And that is something, something that is uh, perhaps then more needed in low and middle income countries so that to unleash innovation, but at the same time they have a harder time to actually carry out these, these projects and this kind of regulation because they may not have the capacities to do that. And there's also uh, the more trade-offs to it because one of the important promises related to this agile regulation is that low- and middle-income countries can perhaps leapfrog other countries. They can make a huge jump in their economic uh, 
uh, development and wealth creation and so on with this agile regulation uh, to foster innovation. Um, but there's also the risk, unfortunately not, unfortunately not without historic precedent, that then these countries become sort of a test bed, a testing ground, an experimental field for, for technologies. So you're testing technologies that other countries would not accept in their backyard. Um, uh, and that is certainly something that should also be considered here. And um, well, this another reason why uh, agile regulation may fail, may, may not lead to really sustainable or sustained growth in uh, in developing countries, um, is that uh, well, it, the idea is that it kind of uh, attracts investment, it it signals uh, innovativeness, a ready, readiness to open open the market to be uh, to foster innovation. That is also something that has been emphasized in many policy documents. But the risk here, again, is that these investments are only very in the, uh, much in the short term. That they are, uh, so investment isn't tracked, that there's actually capital flowing into a country, value creation takes place, there's economic growth, but the question is, what is growing exactly? Which businesses are growing? Is it domestic industries? Is it local industries? And uh, the risk here is that these investments flow in, but they're only uh, therefore with the idea of achieving short-term gains, a short profit, and then they're pulling out again. So this is kind of the opposite of having sustainable growth. That is also to be considered. When you talk about the sustainable growth, uh, I mean, the key issue here is how to involve also citizens and different views, right? Because in the end, to whom is this regulation catering? And John, I alluded to the fact that you were leading the, the first global assembly last year. So maybe what's your take on how can we actually bring a participatory approach to digital regulations? How can we bring citizens and different voices in the process? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we could all agree that there are really clear normative justifications for involving citizens in these processes. You know, the, the process of making policy, engaging people in it, produces more legitimacy. Uh, you know, we're sort of intrinsically realizing our objectives of development. You know, if we understand development not as a process of, of having something, but as a process of being able to choose what you have, then of course, public participation is critical. But there are also instrumental benefits of public participation, and this is really clear in the digital space. And when I say that, I mean that the regulation is improved, the outcome, the, the what of regulation is improved when citizens are engaged in the development of that regulation. And this is obvious in the field of, of digital when, you know, we talk about, I think, just, you know, imagine sort of uh, our friends and regulatory environments ourselves, and then imagine, like, the folks out there building apps, uh, mobile, you know, technology, um, you know, exploring blockchain, et cetera. You know, these, these concepts are things that we talk about in these meetings, but there are other people out there actually building these tools. And how do we, how do we develop this regulation without... Uh, really activating that collective intelligence, that collective wisdom um, within within our citizenry, um, and so you know, obviously this is the the why should we do participation? I, I can imagine that's something we all agree with, but I just wanted to start with that point. Um, now I'd love to just share a couple of examples of of how this has happened. Um, so. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but there's really been an explosion of startup legislation across the African continent. Really a recognition that, you know, innovative high growth companies, um, you know, might, um, you know, given their economic impact would really benefit from uh, specific regulatory reforms. And, you know, the, the sort of new legislation in Senegal, Nigeria, and DRC has all been originally drafted by citizens. So citizens came together, they started using, you know, techniques like you know, we call them policy hackathons, essentially identifying what the challenges are for digital entrepreneurs, um, really exploring then what might be some proposals for addressing those challenges, and then, you know, going into small groups and then workshopping this into uh, policy proposals. Uh, in the case of the Senegal Startup Act, uh, this was a 19-month process. You know, entrepreneurs went through a, you know, really like a co-creation of process to develop an initial Startup Act. It went through several rounds of iteration. Um, there was a, a sort of a Facebook Messenger chatbot that was deployed to be able to reach entrepreneurs around the country and, and a lot of sort of, you know, exploration around how more people might be involved in these processes. They went through 20 rounds rounds of drafting of that law, bringing in government, of course. The president hosted a national town hall meeting, publicly televised, to share the, the law, the legal reform, uh, and to in, invite more inputs. And ultimately, uh, you end up with a, with a regulatory reform um, you know, that, that transformed the tax environments in Senegal, where you, you went from 11 different tax rates then to two tax rates. You dropped 
um, business registration costs by 60%, and you end up with a, a tax holiday for all small businesses below the sort of minimum level of, of taxation, as well as sort of you know bespoke um, support for uh, labeled startups, uh, such as you know public procurement uh, support, etc. Um, so this is just an example of how you know uh, citizens, uh, those affected by by regulation, can be involved um, in this particular space. Um, but I also wanted to you know in the context of this you know, global internet governance forum, I also wanted to share with you an example of, um, you know, what global public participation could look like. And I'd like to invite my colleague Nina, if you could share the last slide of the Mentimeter. I'm not going to kill you guys with PowerPoint, I just have one slide. Um, not, not too much text. Um, Yeah, so this is this is an image of uh, sort of lottery selection. Um, so last year we organized the world's first global citizens assembly. I'm not sure if, if people in the room are familiar with citizens assemblies or sort of lottery selected processes or what political scientists sometimes call sortition. The idea is essentially to identify representatives not based on you know the the sort of people that are most connected or the wealthiest, which unfortunately is often the selection criteria for attending events like this, um, or you know people that are sort of representing uh, civil society organizations, sort of stakeholder models. But what happens if we actually go out and we identify representatives through a lottery uh, in which anyone on earth could participate? Uh, so we developed a four-step global lottery process. Uh, the first step was to take a, um, a NASA database of population density over overlaid on a 2D model of planet Earth, and we selected 100 locations at random across planet Earth. We then uh, went and recruited local community organizations. These local community organizations then went around, and they literally went on the street to do uh, on-street recruitment. You know, literally, they might knock on your door if there was a point nearby, inviting you to participate in a global citizens' assembly, perhaps on internet governance, for example. And then the, um, the the, we ended up developing a pool of about 675 potential participants um, globally from all of these 100 locations, and then organizing a global lottery to then pick 100 people such that they came, we had one person from each of these geographic points, so we represented sort of the, the demographic distribution of humanity from a geographic perspective. And then uh, we looked at other demographic characteristics like gender, uh, age, a socioeconomic status was proxied by educational outcome, uh, as well as their perspective on the, on the climate and ecological crisis to ensure that this was not, not a biased uh, assembly. Um, and we essentially then brought these people together. 60% of them lived on less than $10 per day. They spoke 42 different languages. They came from 49 countries. 11 of the assembly members were fully illiterate. And we organized an assembly in which they were provided with information materials and a learning journey to ensure that they could understand the complexity of the the topics involved and supported them to deliberate for 68 hours. They developed what they called the People's Declaration for the Sustainable Future of Planet Earth. Uh, I find that quite beautiful. Uh, and this is a name that actually the assembly members themselves came up with through a, through a sort of multi-stage co-creation process. And I, I want to share this because I would like for you to imagine, you know, what might, you know, we talk about sort of declarations in the future of the internet. Uh, we talk about a global compact. Um, and I think these are, these are critical. You know, we, we absolutely must establish principles for the internet. Uh, we're going to talk about harmonization next and the, how important that is. Um, but, you know, what, what might these processes look like if everyone on earth had a participation had the opportunity to participate, and all of these different voices and perspectives were included. Thank you. Everybody online. You need to be online. So it's still hard. Thank you very much. Yeah, and well, I mean, th there was a question actually from the audience, a provocation, which was saying everyone online. And so this was actually why it's so critical when we think about these participatory processes to also embed them in, in a really local context. And so actually, when we talked about these 100 locations and recruiting local community organizations, each of the members of the assembly were hosted w by a local community organization, and they were provided with internet access, a device. They were also provided with a, a translator companion. And I think it's important to, to just share that of the 100 members, 34 of them had never been on a video call. That's not, not even a sort of FaceTime, WhatsApp video, uh, let alone a Zoom call. And, and just imagine that. This was last year. So we're a year into the pandemic, a year and a half into the pandemic, and 34% of the people in the Global Assembly had never before talked to somebody through a video call.
Um, so, and this is this is when I share this because I think that there are opportunities to reimagine stakeholder engagement and public participation, even given the digital divide that in can include all voices. Thank you very much, John. I think that was a very beautiful example, and I think a lot of participants uh, might join you later in a breakout group to discuss uh, these and, and other ideas further. But what I'm taking from from your two points is, yes, we do need uh, different kinds of regulation that, that puts the citizen at the center and that also deals with the fact that technological regulation just is at a much faster pace. But you also alluded in your point, again, to the fact, how do you actually harmonize regulation? Is harmonization desirable? How do you bring different people who might not have the skills to participate in such a process on board um, and that goes back to the discussion you you had briefly before about digital sovereignty the Brussels effect how countries can adapt their own digital regulation to a framework that is fitting so maybe let, let's for the last 10 minutes go back to this question before I let you go into the breakout groups and maybe Pascal maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this harmonization aspect what are forces uh, or factors from your perspective that contribute to more global harmonization and digital policy, or what does it impede it? Yeah, thanks very much. So this is a very, it's a big question. Um, I probably can just point to, uh, to a couple of points here. I think one of the most important drivers is to have some kind of regional integration, regional organizations that are driving uh, digital transformation and regulation for the digital transformation. We have seen that with the African Union, which has uh, now enacted a clear, very clear and strong agenda on digital change with its digital transformation strategy but also perhaps even more importantly, it's a uh, digital poli uh, data policy framework. Um, so this, this is certainly a very important uh, driver for harmonization, um, for building something like a digital single market uh, on the African continent also. So that is a major project that the African Union is uh, working towards. And these efforts are also supported probably by, one could call them functional pressures, because um, there are clear economic incentives for more integration, for more harmonization. Uh, only in this last decade we have seen that uh, there has been a huge proliferation of access to internet, mainly mobile internet, especially on the African continent. There's a huge uh, jump in access to internet, which means now is the time that more and more uh, data is generated. Ge data is generated, used, it, is, it will flow across borders to the extent that this, this is possible, and this will create interdependencies between countries, and thus also pressure to find ways of, of harmonizing rules to reduce tr transaction co uh, costs and, and frictions between co uh, countries because these, this kind of data is unlocked more and more. So I think these are important uh, drivers of harmonization. But there are also um, major structural impe impediments that have to be kept in mind. And these are, for instance, that um, countries are at different, if you want to call it, stages of uh, adoption of digital technology. To take an example, the, the internet economy or digital economy, however you want to call it, uh, in Kenya is almost 7%, which is quite large. Uh, in, here in Ethiopia it is about 1%. So that's a huge m difference in the relative importance of the sector, which means there will also be different interests in, in wh what and how to regulate the digital economy, data flows, and so on. And of course there are other uh, structural differences in terms of the infrastructure, uh, the capital that is available, uh, digital skills, education, um, uh, and so on. And this means that countries will be at different positions, but will also have different possibilities of entering into debates on regulation, of getting involved internationally in fora and other uh, debates on how to regulate the digital uh, transformation and the digital economy. Yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. I remember, Helani, you made a point in, in before about the role of GDPR and uh, what role that plays also in harmonization also for other countries. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on that? Um, I think GDPR shows two nice aspects of the drivers of a particular type of harmonization. And I think we should recognize we don't really haven't defined what harmonization means, and it could really mean a whole lot of things. But um, Economics is the first thing, right? I mean, in, a, in many countries, so, I mean, take Sri Lanka, for example, we passed Asia's first personal data protection law, South Asia's first one, right? Not enacted yet. We don't have the money for that, so next year maybe it'll come into force, but it's passed. The biggest driver of that was the ability to do digital services trade with the EU. We have a huge software export industry. We have a huge outsourced data processing industry, right? It was driven by the businesses. And I think that's fine. So economics is a driver. 
But luckily, I think civil society for the last 20, maybe more, has really been focused on the harms and ways of mitigating harms of data, right? Particularly in the, I would say, the last 10 years. And thankfully, we have that force coming into force. So for example, you know, the need for privacy that, you know, India has finally recognized at the highest level, it came up you know, the working groups were very civil society driven with government. It was a very bottoms up approach. And thanks to the international fora that civil society across many countries now connected, I mean, IGF is one, but there are many others, that then comes up and then goes down again to other countries. So that force, I think, is now real. And I think governments can't ignore that. Like 20 years ago, when it came to telecom policy, nobody was talking about digital rights or whatever, right? There were rights implications, huge ones, right? I mean, I come from a country when telecom cell phone networks were used to triangulate and take people into jail to find locations. Of course, there were human rights implications, but it wasn't this big conversation. So the civil society voice and the need for a rights-based approach is one force. And then the economics that's driving. So I think that that's a clash, but I think it's a good clash. That's a conversation we should have. So in GDPR, you finally see both, right? Sort of trying to be balanced. Perfect. Thank you so much. I, I think in the interest of time, because I want to leave space also for the breakout discussion, I would leave the discussion because I think it was a very nice closing point also. But I would give you the opportunity to have another closing point when introducing now the breakout <laughs> session. So maybe Nina, if you could put up the slide again on Mentimeter, because we actually would like to go with you in three breakout groups now. Um, but there is a hint to that because um, we obviously always disadvantage our virtual participants. So one of the three groups is going to be virtual and the virtual group is allowed to choose. So you can choose in the chat uh, of the Zoom call which group you would like to participate in and the group that gets most votes in the virtual will be held virtual. The other two groups will be held here in the room. So sorry to everybody who is here and others with me. Um, you will have only two groups to choose from. But maybe uh, combining a short closing uh, statement of each of you with a short pitch for the breakout groups uh, would be helpful. Um, we will then have about 30 minutes to discuss in the breakout groups. A reminder to my panelists, um, we need one rapporteur per group, so one person that will um, take the key messages of your discussion back to the plenary, because after the three breakout groups, we're going to come back here for 10 minutes to close a little bit, look out for the next steps, and um, see what also your experiences, your ideas uh, in this rich discussion have been. So over to you for a short pitch. So let's start with John, Group 1, on participatory approaches to regulate digital policy. Yeah, thanks. This is actually a great feed-in from the, the last conversation we're having about harmonization. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenging, um, you know, it's challenging to have a conversation about why should we have harmonization. I think we can all agree that it's important. It's like really... Um, uh, quite self-evident. Um, when we talk about this infrastructure, I think it's pretty hard to agree with um, the question, you know, especially if we're talking about what's in the interest of citizens, what's in the interest of the global population, it's pretty hard to. Um, and I, I would love to introduce a concept from a Colombian-American anthropologist called Arturo Escobar. He talks about the pluriverse. Um, and, you know, it, it's a recognition that we live in a world where many worlds exist. So if we want to harmonize, then the question is, how do we bring these different worldviews together? And how do we ensure that you know, this technology doesn't just replicate sort of colonial dynamics? And I introduced in the, in the beginning the sort of different models of, of, uh, of um, sort of regulation that are being imposed on many countries around the world around sort of state-sponsored state spying, corporate-sponsored spying, or sort of a rights-based model developed outside. Um, and the question is, how can we bring all of these different models together into a harmonized framework? Um, and I, I think it, it really requires participatory approaches. And so I'd love to host a little conversation with you all and understand your experiences of public participation and create a, a little space in the breakout where we can learn from each other. And, and hopefully, um, yeah, contribute to our collective consciousness through a participatory process about how we might do more and better public participation. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, Pascal, over to you for the pitch for breakout group two on agile innovative forms of regulation. Yeah, so in the second group, um, we will zoom into the larger regulatory models and look at more specific forms of regulation, such as regulatory sandbox and so on, and discuss to what extent they can be transferred to different contexts um, where you think they work well, where they might not work so well, um, where maybe we need other forms uh, of regulation that we haven't covered so far. 
So this will be the, the topic of the second group. Thank you very much. And then over to you, Helani, for the last group on harmonization versus fragmentation. I think the biggest challenge th for the internet is where the nation state ends and where it meets the internet. Um, and when we talk about harmonization, the question is, do we go to the lowest common denominator and end up with an international set of rules that broadly work for everybody, but really not, does, not, does not work for anyone because it's so basic? Do we go to developed economies models like the GDPR, or do we go local? There's a lot of calls for how important nation states and community values are. But on the other hand, there are plenty of communities in my country and other countries that don't allow women to go online and put people in vans and kill them for protesting online, right? So where does community values and interests stop, nation interests stop when it comes to data, internet governance, any of these values, and how international do we become? Thanks. That's the last breakout. Perfect. So, Nina, do you have already some hint what the virtual participants prefer? Um, they're not very decisive. <laughs> they're between you, John, and you, Pascal. Um, so, maybe let's... Um, John, would you like to join me here on my computer and go to the virtual world? I would love to. And for anyone in the room that would like to talk about participation, because we're going to have, we'll have the participation conversation online, um, just feel free to come up and find me afterwards. All right. Thank you. Great. I mean, you can also join in virtually or see how it works, but uh, John will be in the virtual group and the other two, I guess, uh, Helani will stay here in this corner and Pascal will maybe go over to this corner so we see how we can manage in this not so favorable room setting to have some conversations. Please uh, select the rapporteur to report back to the plenary and be back in 25 minutes at quarter two so that we can have 15 minutes to wrap up and, and share the findings together. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Hey, I just I want to introduce a really quick concept that we're increasingly calling a, a binary session because we all see how difficult these hybrid formats are, where we have people joining online and offline in a sort of we, we pretend a sort of similar space. And so what we wanted to do in this was offer a binary meeting where you could have fully offline discussions and fully online discussions. But there are a few people that would like to join the participation conversation that are in the room. And just to say, if you would like to, you just need to have your own device and then connect to the online call. And so you're essentially, even though you're physically here, you'll join virtually in the call. So that's also an option. All right, thank you.
those of you guys that are online, um, you have been you have been 
wait anymore. We have only 10 minutes left. I'm really sorry. Perfect. Then let's get started. And maybe we start with the group, Helani's group, on fragmentation harmonization. Oh, you're still writing. OK. Pascal, who is the rapporteur in your group? That Let would be uh, Sinit. Sinit, can I ask you to deliver us the key messages for the group on agile approaches to regulation? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Sinit. I'm from the Tony Blair Institute. Um, so uh, I think we, di we discussed uh, quite a few things. I think we acknowledge the, the challenges and the tensions around the nature of regulating the kind of digital world, in particularly the speed at which change happens, the kind of ge geography and how expansive it is. Um, also considering the the power dynamics that between, say, state governments versus global organizations um, versus uh, big tech companies. Um, I think so. Some of the some of the key takeaways was. Number one, what do we even mean by agile regulation? What does that actually look like? How agile can it actually be in practice? Um, the second one was questioning uh, to what extent, I guess, the value of innovation has almost been fetishized, right? Um, and thinking about what are the other competing values that perhaps we need to kind of bring much more forward to the tables to, to manage um, uh, the, it, to manage innovation and to make sure that innovation is challenged in a, in a way that is constructive to society. Um, we had an interesting debate about who, uh, who is the right person to, to lead an own, um, own kind of regulation in this space uh, and some of the challenges around sandbox approaches. Um, do they really work? We kind of, uh, I think Pascal uh, highlighted to us that there hasn't been a, an extensive review of, of whether they work. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, as coming back to the point around who it should be, the kinds of organizations like the UN who are kind of have the global reach and potential influence don't necessarily have the regulatory power. Um, and also, it would be challenging for them to, to have the speed to, to move. Uh, did I miss anything else? I think that's it. So I'll hand over to the next uh, group. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very concise. Um, then I would like to ask you to, to report for the group uh, on harmonization fragmentation before we move to the virtual group. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Rachel Pollack. I work with UNESCO uh, on freedom of expression and the safety of journalists. Um, so we had a really uh, rich and interesting discussion. Um, several of us said that it was w one of the best that we've had in this conference. So thank you very much to the organizers um, and to all of the panelists. Um, uh, yeah, so we covered uh, many different elements um, of this debate. Uh, we started with the question um, if there are examples of good model laws uh, globally uh, around these issues of internet governance. Um, there was uh, the idea that, uh, for example, in access to information laws, um, there are standards, international standards, but often the challenge comes in, uh, in implementation. But then we, we also spoke about governance of the technical layer and bodies like the IETF um, who have used the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance uh, and then asked the question if that still holds today um, and if the multi-stakeholder model is sufficient in other areas uh, beyond the technical layer. Um, we heard from one government representative uh, that made the distinction between government on the internet and government and sorry governance of the internet and governance on the internet um, and that uh, we may be able to regulate more on content issues, um, but less lower down on the stack uh, related to technical infrastructure. Uh, we had one very interesting example of harmonization um, at work and uh, successfully in, in practice um, from the East African community, um, which has harmonized laws on cybersecurity in seven countries. Um, and we heard about how that has uh, happened um, through different phases of harmonization, 
four different phases, um, resulting in some common minimum standards that are agreed to, um, and then others that are optional according to the country, uh, how they've worked to build capacity in, in order to implement these laws, um, and have done so through public-private pri public partnerships. Um, and last, we had a question about uh, conditions, um, it's, for example, in legislation like the DSA, if that is exported to other parts of the world, or if data and services are used uh, within a region, uh, and if there are some minimum standards that should be at place, um, for example, in, in worker conditions. Um, I think that summarizes most of the points, but if anyone else from that group would like to come in with uh, additions or corrections, uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that was an excellent summary. Uh, and then over to you, John. I think you are reporting for the virtual group to make it easier technically. Yeah, so I'll share back for the, the conversation that we had online about public participation. Uh, I'm going to do my best to represent what was really an incredible conversation with a lot of wisdom and experience on the call. Um, we heard from Internet Society uh, talking about a global initiative called We the Internet, uh, which was organized in the last years. It was essentially a global deliberation on the future of the Internet, decentralized. So this was organized at national level. Uh, you would have national level deliberations. In Rwanda, for example, we organized the national deliberation which was structured essentially as a citizens, a, a one-day citizens' assembly or citizens' dialogue where we had, during COVID, um, sort of um, facilitators, trained uh, facilitators that went out to the communities to bring people together in small groups of, of five and then brought together into a plenary discussion that was taking place online, so kind of hacking the hybrid model in the, in the sort of uh, COVID experience. Um, but the, the We the Internet project was able to bring voices of citizens from, I think, 70 countries um, together into a document to provide recommendations to decision makers and to the IGFs. So this is one of the examples that was shared. We also had a member, a former regulator from Mexico, uh, who is also working with an organization, Rizzo America, and uh, also with APC, sharing her experiences, and a colleague who's joining us actually in the room who came online, uh, Suha from APTI in Bangladesh, sharing experiences about uh, shifting um, sort of offline cooperatives into digital cooperatives and digital cooperatives. I could share, and I'm going to try to sort of summarize the points into four uh, buckets. Um, and the first one, um, non-ironically, is that consultation takes time. Um, I think our, our breakout group would have benefited from a little bit more time to deepen these conversations. Um, but there's really a recognition that these consultative processes are oftentimes really constrained by certain political opportunities or sort of uh, processes where we're sort of the regulation becomes like a bit of a uh, box ticking exercise where it's like we need to talk to citizens let's try and fit that in you know between Wednesday and Friday um, they get a couple of minutes to talk and then we're going to summarize the results um, and so that's one of the the conclusions is that really participation does take time the second is that it really needs to be designed and planned and we need to recognize that a lot of times citizens and constituents uh, need to go through a learning journey to be able to meaningfully deliberate about these topics on the one hand um, I often think about Jim Fishkin, uh, when he, he describes the fact that we, you know, when we go to, um, you know, vote in elections, we're often sort of, um, you know, political parties are using the same tools that Coca-Cola uses to sell sugar water to children um, in order to determine which political parties we're going to be voting for. Um, and, and so we need to think about how citizens can be meaningfully informed to be able to engage in these conversations and to take decisions. Um, and then also, also recognizing that not all of these conversations really affect citizens. Uh, you know, like uh, in, we, we heard an example from sort of net neutrality which we've seen in many countries in the world has really galvanized civil society and citizens to engage in these conversations. Um, and just recognizing that citizens don't necessarily have an interest in all of these conversations or necessarily see how these conversations affect their lives. So we might also consider forms of financial inducements and otherwise to incentivize citizens to actually engage in these processes. Um, another point that we heard about was the fact that these agile approaches can often actually become sort of a backdoor to regulatory hijack. And I think that that's, that's really clear, that you sort of, you create a sort of a dual channel, a sandbox where we can sort of offer alternative regulation, and then those end up going to the same large companies that have the resources to actually go through the standard regulatory framework in the first place. And so just making sure that these sort of agile forms of regulation uh, and processes don't sort of end up um, 
you know, contradicting their initial intention, intended purposes. Um, and then finally, we heard really about the importance of engaging citizens, particularly at the diagnosis stage, or what you would call the sort of agenda setting stage of a policy making process, uh, to make sure that we can really hear from citizens and let them sort of articulate what the, what the key challenges are and perspectives and bring in their lived experiences in, into that, that process. Um, and I, I just want to recognize that, uh, again, we did need a lot more time. So um, I, I would just want to hand over if there is anyone online to create a space for, for those virtual voices to appear in the main room. If you'd like to come off mute and, and say hello and add anything. Well, I think we're also at the end of our time. Um, so I would like to use the last two minutes to thank everybody in the room for this very fruitful discussion, specifically to you, Helani, John, and Pascal, for uh, giving us some fruitful thought, for uh, sparking the discussion, and for leading also the, the breakout groups. But a big thanks to all of you um, still here with us. And, and we really enjoyed the conversation. And we are also aware of the fact that 45 minutes, or what was it, even 30 minutes of discussion was way too short. Um, so what we would actually like to propose is to uh, follow up and have another conversation even after the IGF online to keep on discussing the issues that we just had in these three groups. So if you're interested in joining us in these conversations and then see where this journey takes us, just approach us, uh, leave the speakers or me uh, your business cards, and then we will make sure to include you in a follow-up where we can also then share maybe the summary of the key messages from today, the session report, um, but also give you more space to share your experiences, your lessons learned, because you're the experts here in the room, and I think we can all still learn a lot from each other on this level of discussion. So uh, thank you very much for being here with us today, and uh, have a good rest of the day at the IGF, and uh, talk to you soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you.